coming up as a musician in the 1960s and 70s, playing R&B and rock and roll and jazz, uh, cultural appropriation, although we didn't, or at least I didn't know the term at the time, was a big part of my life and the lives of my brothers and the people around me. Uh, it was a factor, it was a force, uh, and I also was aware back in those days of Norman Mailer, the author Norman Mailer's uh, famous essay, The White Negro, and other commentary in that area. My next guest uh, has written a book that I read in one sitting. I enjoyed it so much and got so much out of it. Uh, Dr. Lauren Michelle Jackson's book is entitled White Negroes, which is the main title, which I think is a, perhaps a throwback to the Mailer essay, subtitle When Cornrows Were in Vogue and Other Thoughts on Cultural Appropriation. She teaches at Northwestern University in the Departments of English and African American Studies. She's uh, written for publications too numerous to count, and she joins us now. So first of all, Dr. Jackson, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for reading this book that I enjoyed so much. And, and, and you know, I was thinking about places, uh, a, a way to open our conversation just now. And one of the things that came to mind for me was um, I remember reading a long time ago that when Elvis Presley first came up and his first popular song in his hometown or the town he had moved to of Memphis, Tennessee, was That's All Right, Mama. And That's All Right, Mama had been a hit on what was called the race records charts in those days of 1946, blues, you probably know all this, blues singer Arthur Big Boy Crudup. Elvis did it and he went on the radio, uh, the story goes, and was asked, where did you go to high school? And the reason why he was asked, where did he go to high school? Because his answer revealed that he was white for people that would not otherwise know he was right, white. So to me, that anecdote tells a couple of things. One, that to people at the time, Elvis was sounding like a black person playing black music, at least the DJ thought so. Two, that it was a pro product of an intensely racist and segregated environment. And three, I would bet that in that interview, uh, Arthur Big Boy Crudup's name didn't come up. So. Uh, a lot of people would say, you know, w w multiply that anecdote by a thousand, that cultural appropriation is a bad thing. You know, a public enemy had a line about it, as I recall, you know, about Elvis with the words we can't use on uh, on, on the air. So um, the uh, my question for you is, uh, you seem to have a deeper and maybe more generous view of cultural appropriation while at the same time recognizing its profound faults. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I, I would say so. I, I think I differ in that I find appropriation really fascinating and really rich for cultural criticism, for cultural critique, for introspection. And, and I think Appropriation gets, you know, as I say in the first line of my book, appropriation gets kind of a bad rap. And and so the way we talk about, tend to talk about appropriation when we have articles that go viral in the media and in the press, you know, it's always because of, you know, an, an instance of appropriation that we as, as a public or maybe as a community don't really agree with. Whereas appropriation in and of itself is not, is not harmful, is not necessarily wrong or bad. It's just an instance of repurposing something for a new situation, um, you know, to make appropriate, you know, something that was taken from someplace else. And so that happens all across, you know, lots of art forms. I mean, music is tends to be such a touchstone for a lot of people on this topic. And, and so if you think of the formation of even something like rap music or something like hip hop, which is celebrated as such a, you know, a thought, authentically black American a musical tradition um, in the same way that, you know, rock and roll or maybe the blues once were, you know, actually, you know, involved a lot of cultural exchange, a lot of mixing, a lot of repurposing intergenerationally, interculturally, interracially. And so, you know, on one hand, you know, that's an instance of appropriation that we can celebrate and that we like, whereas we have the other versions that we don't like and that we don't approve of. And so what I'm trying to argue in the book 
um, is that the difference between, you know, the sort of ethical or non-ethical appropriation, if we want to call a difference like that, um, is really power. And what happens when certain people get to profit off of their creations and their intellectual property and other kinds of people don't get to. So you're making a distinction in a way between what might be called almost a, a, a conversation between different populations where maybe uh, in this case, white people use the black forms uh, as a legitimate kind of expression and, and, and black people historically maybe use white Protestant forms to synthesize it with their own to create jazz or gospel. And that is almost an exchange among equals, but when it gets to appropriation, it's either an abuse of power or uh, a reinforcement of negative stereotypes about a group that doesn't have power or, or something along those lines. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I think what's what's always important to remember is that we live in a very unequal society. And so when you live in a society of inequality, when you live in a society where you know, the almighty dollar is is the end game. Um, you know, the way things circulate, the way culture circulates is never going to be neutral, is never going to be an even playing ground. And so if you look throughout history or even you look through recent history, as my book does, I'm looking at primarily within the new millennium. So within the last 20 years, you know, you'll see that, you know, things just so happen to flow in the way of, uh, white prophets and seem to flow away from um from from black people and away from black creators and you know part of the underlying argument is that you know that, that it's not just a coincidence right it has a lot to do with the sort of foundational logic undergirding america undergirding our country and i think a big boy crude up would agree with that um that there's a there's a line in your book you talk about the economic uh, uh barriers the structural race and racism if you will built into our economy among other, other things Con and you write contrary to myths that say if only black folks did right saved money went to college got married started a business nothing is as predictive of success in america as being born white. Uh, Dr. Jackson, can I just brief uh, um, side, maybe side, but, but I really didn't like that Will Smith movie, uh, The Pursuit of Happiness, because I, did you see it? Uh, I, I didn't, I, I don't see a lot, a whole lot of movies, but I, I didn't see that one. <laughs> where it's spelled H-A-P-P-Y-N-E-S-S. -S. The whole message is like, this guy's a hero because he risked his entire family's financial security to speculate on the wall, on, on the stock market and got rich. And uh, the fact is nine times out of 10, that person would have lost out. And uh, I felt like the message of the movie was exactly what you're talking about here. You know, you should be an entrepreneur. You should do this, you should do that without acknowledging that the, the deck is stacked before the cards are even dealt, which I think, you know, speaks to what you're saying here. Um, right? I mean, am I off base? No, absolutely. I think they're, um, it's kind of funny because I, I, I remember, you know, as a kid in elementary school, I feel like all the time we were asked to do these assignments that would expect us to, you know, come up with a new invention, come up with a new idea. And it led me to believe that uh, for some reason that inventing something cool, like the, I don't know, like the Swiffer or something would be like a really important component of my adult life that uh, hasn't seemed to pan out. But it all has to do with this sort of American myth of, uh, of intellectual property that, you know, if you invent something, if you create something unique, if you are risky, if you become an entrepreneur, you know, you deserve to be uh, credited for that. You deserve to be wealthy for that. You deserve to be so wealthy at the expense of other people actually being able to uh, have a roof over their head and clean and clothe themselves and 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 live and eat, right? Um, but you know, that's a that's an unequal myth. That's not something that actually happens for um, a lot of people, but it especially so rarely, if ever, happens to and for you know black people. And so. I think I think that I, that movie is like a really good example of, of the the fact that you know 
what the you know quote unquote black community needs is not financial literacy because all the data is showing that actually no like black people you know who are you know more likely to be in poverty you know they actually have better saving habits they actually have better financial literacy than a lot of people in the middle and upper middle class it, so it's it's not about literacy it's not about you know a five step 10 step plan to get out of debt it's it's none of these things like all like all it's all subterfuge um to to really hide the fact that you know this system is not built for certain people to win regardless of what they do and right. certain movies, like you know really emphasize emphasize that myth and the financial literacy is really stigmatizing the people who are uh, facing these barriers and being treated unfairly, saying it's your fault, rather than the systems. You know, I, I met when I was young um, a guy who had made doo-wop records, like in the 1950s, and he said in the old days in Philadelphia, they would drive around the black neighborhoods and look for kids on street corners singing, and they'd give them 25 bucks to make a record, and the record might or might not you know, sell a million copies, but if it sold a million copies, all they had was 25 bucks. So are you gonna tell Frankie Lyman of Frankie Lyman and the teenagers who went to prison, who died young, who, you know, why do fools fall in love was a gigantic hit. Are you gonna tell him that if only he had had a little financial literacy, he'd have been okay? I mean, that's 25 bucks only gets you so far, right? Right, absolutely. So um, you start out the book, um, by talking about, uh, you don't name her, but it's pretty clear who you mean, uh, when you talk about uh, a certain former Disney star uh, okay. in unicorn pajamas rattling her waist, uh, prompting Americans to find language and meaning for exactly what was happening, the language with which to encounter this white girl who so loved black dance. She's the one who like sticks her tongue out in a weird way, right? Isn't that who we're or, talking about? Yeah, or she used to, I don't know, I think she's um, sort of moved on to several different other personas um, since then. But yeah, of course, of course I'm talking about, uh, you know, Miley Cyrus, right. who, you know, around 2013, um, I don't know, caught the bug, caught the wave, I don't know, and suddenly, you know, discovered twerking and it became her thing, it became her brand. She sort of took, you know, took a left music wise. She started hopping onto rap records, hip hop records, and and really, uh, you know, made a name for herself as as the you know twerking queen of, of some kind. <laughs> now, uh, I have to say that you know, as a, as a white man, that I was like put off by that video. I felt as if she was playing on racist stereotypes about black women in particular and that it meant a lot something very different for a black woman to be twerking than for a young a wealthy white girl to be twerking because of the exaggeration later you talk in the book you talk about uh kim kardashian i guess it is and her uh you know, adoption through surgery and so on of some body characteristics and so on. But I felt as if Miley was really kind of, it was, to me, it was offensive, but I, I don't know if you were offended. I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if offended is quite the right word. I mean, I mean, maybe put off is a good word um, or puzzled maybe more like it um which is you know why i mean i talk about her in the book uh oh so briefly if only because i think you know when she you know when she was doing that also sort of lined up with a very specific time in media and in publishing and i think a lot of people have said their piece on miley and and ultimately maybe that uh, that era of her career wasn't as interesting as maybe we felt like it would. Um, but I think one of the things I try to do in the book is contextualize um, this moment in her career, which I draw parallels to Christina Aguilera's um, 2003 moment, her dirty era moment, where she also is sort of doing the same thing with a certain kind of um, hip hop aesthetic. Um, I try to put it in context with thinking about her career as someone who is coming up very, very so, so young through the Disney Channel 
and someone who has had to essentially live out their adolescence literally in the spotlight, literally on stage, and, you know, look at the real book and the playbook for, you know, as a white girl child star who is supposed to really ride this razor edge between um, being innocent and being sexual, it's like, how, you know, how do I, you know, how as a child star do I actually break out of that? And, you know, as can be seen with Miley, as can be seen with Justin Timberlake, Justin Bieber, Christina Aguilera, even people like um, looking back at, you know, the transitions that someone like Madonna made with her career, um, you know, it was it was through it was through black aesthetics. It was through the sort of danger and the thrill of, of trying on blackness and putting on blackness. And that really seems to be like the the cheat code to for, a, a you know, a white pop star who has to deal with things like um, patriarchy and misogyny to sort of work their way out of that bind, you know, using using black aesthetics. And I, I find that, you know, obviously very troubling, but I also think it's it's fascinating. It's not just a matter of, you know, I'm going to try on twerking because I think it's cool. I think there's something also deeper going on there. Yeah, that's really interesting. And again, we're talking with Dr. Lauren Michelle Jackson about her book, White Negroes, uh, another one that comes to mind uh, that broke his mold, a little bit older than those, was David Bowie, who had this sort of uh, star man, uh, spiders from Mars, glam rock. And then all of a sudden he was doing like sort of funk related, you know, um, fame and white American, uh, young Americans and so on, Freudian slip, I guess. And, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, he did that too. I mean, it was almost like as if a white performer uh, can do a hard reset on their image by adopting, you know, a black styles or something. And uh, uh, what also occurred to me, by the way, talking, thinking about Miley, it just popped into my head while we were talking is here it is a few years later and her dad, Billy Ray Cyrus, <laughs> is flowing in the other direction by jumping on, you know, Nas X and the huge, uh, or Little Nas, I forget his name, and, and the big uh, record of the year, Old Town Road, which is sort of, you know, black appropriation of a white form of country music, right? And uh, here's Billy jumping on that. So it, 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 the, the, it keeps going. And also, by the way, in your book, uh, you, you, you quote Grandmaster Kaz in rap reviews saying, I have all of Billy Joel's S.H. Blank T in my iPod, to which I'm thinking, really? And uh, also citing Simon and Garfunkel's lyrical influences. So there is an element of dialogue to this too, right? Absolutely. And so that's, you know, one of the reasons why I say I'm like, yeah, I mean, hip hop is like one of the most appropriative forms and rap music is one of the most appropriative forms of music like ever. I mean, if you think about something like sampling alone, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we don't even have to talk about sampling. We can talk about the, you know, the interplay between the appropriation of funk and R&B and Motown and people using records and rapping over them and mixing them and, and, and tweaking them and doing, you know, all sorts of things. So, you know, that's an appropriation of a kind too. Um, you know, in the differences, you know, in some cases you have, um, you know, black musical forms being appropriated by another black musical forms. And in other cases you have maybe, you know, lower, you know, low, you know, rappers or like maybe smaller indie artists who are appropriating from, you know, the musical canon in such a way that, you know, the power discrepancy isn't necessarily that, you know, they're going to get the shine while the, you know, the other artist doesn't, you know, there's more of a, it's more of a, um, yeah, there, there's less of that, uh, that fear that, you know, someone's going to run away with your music. But um, yeah, I mean, I, that's why I think examples like that are really important. And, and the mode of the thing of critique is not, it's not necessarily appropriation. It's, it's rather something more like uh, capital, something more like wealth discrepancy. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, yeah. That's 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 really interesting. And I was also thinking, as you were talking about, it was kind of a breakthrough moment uh, when Aerosmith and Run DMC did their joint version of Walk This Way. In fact, it was literally a breakthrough moment because they showed Steven Tyler breaking through the wall and um, they were clearly trying to make a point with that image, I guess. You also quote Leroy Jones, uh, the great playwright and poet and, and uh, 
black thinker of the uh, 1960s and beyond, um, also known as Amiri Baraka, uh, uh, as saying, quote, the idea of a white blues singer is, quote, a violent contradiction of terms. That was, that was interesting to me. Um, it, 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 and he, he also says, you go on to quote him as saying, the white American observes, ready to transform life into style and profit, a process Baraka calls, quote unquote, the cultural lag. So that's interesting. Um, where does that, where does the cultural lag fit into this? And is a white blues singer a contradiction in terms, or is a white blues singer an exploiter, or is a white blues singer just expressing themselves? Or is it all contextual? Uh, well, I mean, I'm a literary critic, so I'm always going to say that it's all contextual. Right, but right. Um, I just, you know, I I really have for a while really adored Baraka's blues people because I think, you know, it, it is a theory of the blues, even if, you know, I think people could totally disagree with it and people have disagreed with it. And, and so the idea of a white blue singer being a, you know, a contradictory person has a lot to do with what you think the blues is mm -hmm. and are. And so Baraka, there's really something like, something, so, something like earth, like something ingrained and something so, so black about the blues such that, you know, when it's away from, away from a black person, like it almost, it almost like isn't. The blues anymore and um something i really enjoy about you know blues people is that it's really just this history of um you know black music and white music and black music and white music just kind of accumulating on top of each mm -hmm. other such that you know on one hand white music is always or white musicians are always sort of seeking something that blues essence that they're never going to find and you know progressively you have black musicians who are reacting to the appropriation of their old forms. And part of their innovation is actually seeing the way the their old forms are being treated and saying, no, we gotta do something new. Um, and so that's something I really, I don't know, I just like really love about, I love about it. I mean, I think, you know, again, people are free to disagree with it, but that's his his definition of the blues. Well, now, you know, the, com the mm -hmm. comedian Martin Mull, uh, white comedian Martin Mull, uh, had a song called The White Middle Class Blues. And it began, I woke up this morning and both cars were gone. I thought that was funny. Um, but Joan, uh, uh, Baraka, by the way, also, first of all, I've discovered blues people when I was a teenager and it just turned my head around in ways I couldn't have predicted. I got, uh, 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 but I also remember, it might've been on TV at the time, saying that white protest singers like Joan Baez and Bomb, Bob Dylan were the sensitive antenna of white racism, which is a phrase that, you know, whether agree or disagree, it just shows how brilliantly his mind worked and how uh, how brilliantly he expressed these thoughts, uh, incisive cutting in just a few words. I mean, maybe it's a combination of the political thinker and the poet in him, I guess. Um, but um, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out, uh, Past Elvis, you say, neither the English rock band The Clash nor the American rock star Bruce Springsteen could exist without the well-established borrowing that brought black music to their doors. You go on to say, though, Springsteen is often aligned with a very white working class tradition. Quote, the far more appropriate or at least co-equal lineage would be Sam Cooke, Smokey Robinson, and James Brown, says historian Jefferson Cowie. I strongly believe that Springsteen would agree with that, number one. Mm -hmm. I mean, he does covers of black music all the time. Uh, so did The Clash. Um, mm -hmm. They, um, to me, I guess, yeah, they reflect a cultural lag, but I, I sense at least a well-intentioned motivation mm -hmm. behind it. And in the case, uh, especially of Springsteen, also drawing from, you know, white folk and country and other traditions, um, Springs seem to me, both those bands actually seem to me very much like archivist mentality in what they do. Like they're very conscious of where they're pulling from. Um, I don't know where I was going with any of this, but any thoughts? <laughs> um, I mean, I'll say that, you know, the thing is with the book is that, you know, I, I don't want to condemn. So anyone 
for the most part, anyone I bring up in the book, I bring up because it's it's an interesting case. It's a case we're talking about. In a lot of cases, it's because it's, you know, in, in art or a product that I think is actually really artistically brilliant. So, you know, I love, you know, Christina Aguilar. I think she's a great artist. I think she's a great vocalist. I think she's an interesting, an interesting figure, you know, Springsteen. I mean, everybody loves Bruce. Like, of course, I think, you know, the point isn't necessarily to condemn like this set of artists or that set of artists, um, but really to think about um, the very multicultural history that all of these artists are working with, whether they're acknowledged as such or not. Um, and so, you know, with Springsteen, it's, it's almost like, you know, less a matter of, of him himself. And I think we could even put like someone like a John Mayer in that category. But, you know, looking at their fan base, look at the looking at the way that they get talked about, you know, Springsteen is so closely associated with a certain very white working class ethos when it's like, actually, no, he was working with working classes of, of all of all shades. Right. Um, and working with a very diverse musical history. Yeah, I think that's right. And I also think it's important, and maybe this speaks to some of your points. I, I've often, or not often, but sometimes taken note of when white artists perform in black style, singers in particular, whether or not they affect a sort of artificial black accent or what they imagine to be a black voice when they sing, which some do. And that never to me has worked as well as when they just sing like themselves but in what we would think of as a black idiom, rhythmically or structurally or musically or whatever, that's always worked to me a lot better for whatever that is. There are two other white figures I think you're pretty, you're, 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 you're quite uh, generous hearted towards, and I say that in a, po a totally positive way. One of them is Norman Mailer, who I mentioned in the introduction. I was always made uncomfortable. I'm, I'm turning out to, I don't want to be like the ally who like, uh, you know, responds emotionally uh, in ways that the people you know, these behaviors are targeted to do not necessarily, but this is just my reactions, okay? I always felt that the, the essay, The White Negro, was part of a kind of white intellectual, especially beat generation phenomenon that externalized and othered black people as a kind of receptacle for their own inner turmoil or emotional needs to project a, a fantasy black figure that, and then to assume aspects of that identity. I mean, it's, as I recall, Mailer talks about, you know, just kind of assumes all black people are like in trouble with the law or something. And, you know, I, so I've always uh, had problems with it, but I got the feeling you weren't quite as rough on old Norman as maybe I was. Um, I mean, so the, you know, my book is called, you know, White Negroes. And so obviously, and, and I use an epigraph from that uh, essay. And so in the book, I wanted to at least, at least try to do my job and, and close read the essay and maybe even, um, you know, tilt it a little bit for my own purposes. And so you're totally right about your reading of the essay. It's, you know, it's really not an essay about black people. It's, it's an essay definitely about a certain kind of white youth generation that's very disaffected, very, you know, having, you know, an existential crisis and what, how do they resolve that? They go to, you know, they look towards, they look towards the, the quote unquote Negro who, you know, in, in Mailer's terms, like by definition is like an existential crisis, like in and of himself, right? The Negro lives in abjection. So that's, that's where the, you know, the hipster goes to learn about how to live abjection, um, which, I think is you know is kind of is kind of an interesting. I mean, it's definitely you know it's definitely worth uh, it's worth interrogation, but I think is also a sort of interesting prospect. So, but the way I read that essay and the way where I'm looking at the essay is not really what he's saying about black people, but really looking at um, what he's saying about a certain what he's saying about whiteness, what he's saying about a certain white youth, because I think there's actually a lot of parallels that can be drawn to. The contemporary and looking at white kids in the contemporary and looking at what they're inheriting politically, what they're inheriting environmentally, um, and and how that 
you know, has an effect on the psyche and how that has an effect on cultural consumption and what people reach to and what people look to. Um, and so that, and that's, so that's, you know, how I found it useful. You know, I'm not interested in like, you know, I don't want to revive, you know, Norman Mailer to celebrate him in any way, but you know, I'll okay. use his words for my own purposes for sure. Well, well, good for you. You could appropriate him if you want. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. And then, uh, we, you know, we, uh, I guess we, we only have a couple minutes left, but I also thought, you know, you showed a generosity of spirit towards Rachel Dolezal, who was famously the person who presented herself as black and even assumed positions of leadership in the black community, wore black clothing and so on, turned out to be uh, white uh, genetically and by background, uh, you had a really interesting uh, sentence about her. You said, the performance of outing Dolezal, who was famously outed by this guy, Jeff Humphrey, the performance of outing Dolezal, interesting choice of word, performance there, had nothing to do with racial justice and everything to do with white-on-white -white crime that uh, uh, really, yeah, I, I took that to mean, among other things, this is like a a family dispute among white people as much, uh, uh, or perhaps more than anything else. This guy kind of outed her, but it, it really seems that was more about what? White uh, act of vindictiveness against, uh, what do you think? Yeah, so the, like, the circumstances around her, like, the or the revelation of, like, who she ultimately was had was wrapped up in um, some controversy that was going on in Spokane where she had alleged that there were um, hate crimes that were being done at um, Eastern Washington University, I believe it was, and also the Spokane and NAACP. And I think there was some strife there. And so this reporter that you know had allegedly come to actually ask her about the hate crimes was actually coming there to sort of undermine her claim to you know complain about these things and her claim to you know critique the you know the local PD or something like that and so you know ultimately it was it was yeah as you say it was a vindictive sort of maneuver that ultimately resulted in like a lot of like emotional strife for for like black people because it was like it was like we got you know drug into this like really petty really local feud but then it was like for the next you know two years it felt like forever you know we had to talk about rachel dolezal we had to litigate rachel dolezal's identity we had to see her on all the talk shows we had to be you know out in public and you could be sitting at the hairdresser next to a total stranger and they'll ask you because you're black you know what do you think about this whole racial Dolezal situation? So it was like, it was really, yeah, it felt like a white on white sort of drive by, but then everybody, you know, we had to like deal with the fallout and we had to, you know, either embrace her or condemn her or decide where she fits in, you know, in the color line, right? And it was like, we didn't ask for this. Like, I don't, you know, if I never hear that woman's name again, and, and now she's changed her name. But if I never hear her name again, like, it'll be too soon. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it's not my problem would be a valid answer, you know, or I don't care, or you work it out and get back to me if you feel yeah. like it. The, uh, all right, well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But again, I want to reiterate how much uh, I enjoyed the book. The author is Dr. Lauren Michelle Jackson. The book is White Negroes When Cornrows Were in Vogue and Other Thoughts on cultural appropriation. Dr. Jackson, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much. This is really lovely. I enjoyed it very much.